Uh, this is your host of Civil Net, Eric Akopian, and we're joined today by Professor Georgi Derlugan, uh, who again, uh, as, as I've said before, needs no introduction. And we're going to be talking about countless different issues, but primarily we're going to be focused on what's been going on this week, especially with the Russian angle of what's going on in, uh, in the Caucasus and specifically in Gharaba. Thank you for joining us, Professor. Uh, what we have seen with this tri-party uh, agreement or this tri-party meetings between uh, Pashinyan, Aliyev, and Putin was an attempt uh, clearly uh, driven by the Russians, in this case by Putin, who's the primary decision maker, to set up or open up all the trade routes in the region. Uh, and sort of put Russia at the center of the wheel of making all of this happen, i.e. opening up this road through Zangezur for, for trade via Turkey, Nakhchivan, through Azerbaijan, to open up uh, Armenia via Azerbaijan into Russia and, uh, uh, and Armenia through Nakhchivan to Iran, while the train networks. Uh, what this reminds me of is a bit of what the Japanese were talking about during World War II, which is this East Asia co-prosperity zone. Obviously, the Japanese imperialists you know, had different ways of achieving that. What we're seeing here, is this really the Russian version of the Caucasus co-prosperity zone in which they essentially force conflicting parties to deal with issues that they haven't been able to deal with? Uh, and to sort of use economics as, uh, to sort of bury politics and to use economics uh, to open up the area and put themselves right at the heart of uh, controlling the area politically and economically. Since we're speaking about international politics and international economic relations, let me remind you from the beginning, uh, the old, or two old British wisdoms from the 18th century. First, in international relations, there are no friends, there are interests. And second, British Prime Minister once remarked that when negotiations come to the issue of trade, concessions are no longer possible. You know, that this is the ultimate, and even in military you can have concessions. You know. uh, Moscow is reacting to the crisis that not only Armenians, but Russians themselves could not see coming. It's amazing, you know, so we can, uh, how they could not see it coming, you know, so we will leave it, you know, for another discussion probably. But they are reacting in a very right way, as you said, you know, that they're trying to undergird their influence uh, through economic and infrastructural ties, you know, they do it institutionally. Uh, the question there is, will they have enough economic power? So you brought up the Japanese co-prosperity zone. That was the Japanese fascist pro project from the 1930s and World War II. Let me remind you, however, you know, that there was the second co-prosperity zone created in the 1950s and the 1960s, and that one worked because there was no Japanese military coercion any longer. You know, there was American umbrella over all of it, it was much more peaceful, and that's why it worked, because there was nothing else left. You know, Japan could no longer uh, conquer uh, their sources of uh, raw materials and cheap labor. So they decided, you know, to attach them to themselves by the only means remaining, economic means. By the way, more or less the same happened in Eastern Europe with German influence. So look at that, you know, the many of the directions of investment are almost uncannily coincide with the former directions of conquest. So it works better. Uh, second, speaking specifically about the railroads, uh, in the late 19th century there was, uh, and Vladimir Putin is largely a late 19th century politician. You know, he thinks in imperial and nationalist terms. Um, like it or not, you know, we're just discussing, you know, how he does it. Uh, let me remind you that German Empire in the late 19th century was all about building railroads because they're the road to Baghdad, famously. You know, so if 
People today wonder how come in Berlin there are all these wonderful archaeological treasures from the East. These were the gifts of Ottoman Sultan to the Kaiser of Germany, transported, you know, these ancient stones were transported literally on the railroad. So railroads matter. The railroads, uh, let me remind you, you know, they stopped in the South Caucasus in the early 1990s. Actually, um, my Armenian builders, once, actually one of them is ethnic Russian, Molokan, uh, very respectfully addressed me and said, Uncle Georgi, you remember the times when railroads were running? You know, this was in another epoch. Many people you know, who are uh, younger than 30 don't remember the railroad. You know, there, there was this, uh, it's think of the past to them. However, why, why did they stop? You know, because in 1990, 91, Azerbaijan blocked uh, railroads going on the eastern side of the Caucasus. And there, I always suggest, look at the map. Because railroads must follow the relief. And there are so many mountains in the Caucasus area where rail transport is just not possible, you know, because it's not only that it cannot climb, it cannot break when it goes downhill, uh, especially loaded. So the railroads are possible only on the Caspian side of the Caucasus or on the Black Sea side through Abkhazia. And that railroad was closed in August 1992 uh, due to the Georgian conflict in Abkhazia. Russia now has a large military, or sizable, let's put it in a military contingent in the South Caucasus, in Armenia and in, uh, in Artsakh. How are they going to supply them? You know, the Russian military base in Armenia, which is the remnant of the Soviet uh, military infrastructure, was the remnant of the old Soviet mobilization economy. However, it could not be resupplied. Let me remind you again, you know, look at the map. This is the closest Russian military uh, staging ground to Syria, which they could not use, simply because even um, diesel fuel had to be flown. You know, to the, and if Georgia and Turkey closed the airspace, that uh, base could not be resupplied. So now Russia primarily needs railroads for uh, all the heavy cargo. And then there are the, they are trying to interest Azerbaijan and Armenia. For Armenia, okay, you are no longer in a blockade. For Azerbaijan, uh, probably even more so, you are not dependent solely on Georgia. Although, how much was that, was that dependence? Uh, but also you are within this market. You know, let me remind you again you know, that Russia has a huge trump card vis-a-vis -vis Armenia and Azerbaijan. These are the diaspora populations. There are millions in Russia. Uh, it's actually very difficult to estimate, you know, because both countries, Armenia and especially Azerbaijan, are trying to inflate the numbers of their population to show that the people who are actually long gone somewhere in Russia or Kazakhstan, they have jobs there. Sometimes men have second families there. You know, but they are shown as being present you know, because presumably, well, they vote. Yeah. The elections. <laughs> or at least in Azerbaijan. Uh, they vote. Uh, they're kind of dead souls, as they're called in, in, uh, in Russian. So Russia has that trump card. Uh, it is very indicative that uh, Turkey also has such a trump card, at least with Azerbaijan. However, nowhere as big and probably nowhere as important. Turkey has been curiously mm, kind of loudly silent call it, in the, uh, in the past several weeks. So on the one hand, there are all these proclamations, you know, that now we are peace-loving, you know, we offer prosperity to Armenia, and blah, blah, at the same time, you know, uh, Erdogan mentions Enver Pasha. Uh, he is making threatening noises towards Iran, but at the same time, you know, we're coming with peace. This could be interpreted as a sign, actually, of weakness, because you need to say that for your domestic constituencies, but there is not much you can actually do. And that will depend on you know, what Turkey can do, uh, as opposed to Russia, will very largely depend on Turkey changing its course in its relations with the West, you know, reaffirming themselves as a NATO partner. Uh, had the US President stayed Trump, 
you know, had he, uh, had he continued, you know, for the second term, there probably would be a military confrontation with Iran, and then Turkey comes with a huge gift to the West. Hey, we are already in Azerbaijan, we are to the north of Iran. If uh, there is any peaceful settlement, which is both in the interest of Iran and hugely in the interest of Armenia, uh, then Azerbaijan loses much of its geopolitical strategic importance, including to Israel. And then we will see more and more of Russian penetration. Let me finish, you know, this part by, uh, again, you know, small but very indicative story that before meeting with Vladimir Putin, both Nikol Pashinyan and Ilham Aliyev consented to undergo medical checkup by, by the Russian doctors who were flown by the special uh, flights of Russian Secret Service. That's actually quite interesting. Can you imagine Macron or any European you know, Western leader you know, or Chinese, for that matter, you know, consenting to uh, such a procedure before seeing uh, Vladimir Putin eye to eye? But Ilham Aliyev did. So this is a very important sign, potentially, you know, that he realizes the, that he needs to reintegrate reintegrate with Russia. This is the way of not losing peace, because very often the countries which won the war lose peace. Uh, this happened in Ar with Armenia in the 1990s. You know, Armenians won the war in Artsakh and they lost peace. They failed to consolidate their gains. Mm -hmm. And Azerbaijan is now trying to do the same. It might be easier for Ilham Aliyev simply because he is now a national hero, but also easier simply because he's the sultan of the place. You know, the, the he's is unanswerable to anyone. Yeah. Unless there is a big riot. Yeah. Uh, this sort of leads to me with the second question, which is the, uh, the Turkey question uh, and Russia. To what extent is uh, Russia comfortable with this Turkish play in the Caucasus, specifically in Azerbaijan? their involvement in this war. To what extent were they really taken by surprise? Because there's a lot of skepticism about that. You know, there's always these rumors about something traded in Syria for something here, which I don't particularly uh, adhere to. Uh, do they see this as a direct threat? Uh, are, they, are they willing to live with, are they willing to live with it? Uh, the one thing that we have seen and you, uh, is that for all the work that Erdogan did, you know, he's actually gained very little uh, from, uh, from the war in Karabakh. Uh, you know, the Russians have in fact gained far more than he ever did, and he did all the heavy lifting. What is the Russian view of the Turkish push in the Caucasus? When we speak about the Russian view, I wouldn't even speak about they, very much like with Azerbaijan. It's an authoritarian regime, it's him. You know, thinking, and it's very difficult uh, to read. You know, it's, in the past it was called Kremlinology. You know, studying what the Kremlin might be thinking. Who stands next to who? Yeah. Exactly. You know, who is standing next to whom uh, on the photos, um, on the official occasions? But even that, you know, uh, implied that there was a collective leadership, as they used to say, in in Soviet times, in the post-Stalin times, at least. Uh, there is no collective leadership in Russia. At present, you know, this is Putin. It is very difficult to imagine how he could look kindly at what happened in Azerbaijan uh, with this war. Uh, that Azerbaijan brought a bully from outside, and of course, you know, Putin would like to be his own bully. But uh, I probably disagree with you uh, that Erdogan didn't win anything. Uh, he won a lot, not only in terms of uh, economic tribute that he can collect from Azerbaijan. And I'm sure that he's collecting and he, they will continue collecting. So if you wish, uh, Turkish military presence in Azerbaijan is the way of ensuring that the tribute is being paid. I see it this way. Uh, but second, and much more importantly, Turkey for the first time in ever in the history of Turkish Republic, showed itself as expansionist power. 
you know, under Erdogan. This has never been. So the slogan of Atatürk was peace at home, peace in the world. Let me remind you. Why? Simply because he was very well aware uh, in the 1920s when he was starting the Turkish Republic that Ottoman Empire had won how many wars with Russia? I think 16 or 17 and they lost 14 out of those or 15. Uh, again, try looking at uh, world map from the Turkish standpoint. Ukraine, Odessa, it was their territory. Bulgaria, Greece, Syria, Mosul. You know, it was all Ottoman Empire until quite recently. How did they lose them? By fighting wars. You know, this is why Turkey actually in the 20th century participated only in one foreign operation. It was the United Nations uh, peace enforcement in Korea because that bought uh, Turkey the entrance into the NATO. It was in a quite vulnerable position. So now, for the first time, Turkey is proactive. Turkey is an important uh, military force in the Middle East, probably too important for some Middle Eastern power to tolerate. Uh, Turkey, as you said yourself, you know, uh, tried to project itself as Sunni variety of Iran, so that they're unifying uh, all possible uh, militant Islamist groups uh, of Sunni persuasion through the Middle East. So they are taking away that honor from Saudis and they are creating you know, very potentially very important um, threat, let me say it mildly, to Western Europe. You know, one possibility, well, we saw it in 2015, just you know, like open, opening the throttle, you know, so er allowing the refugees to pass into Western Europe, creating a huge crisis. The other possibility is actually showing, you know, that we are controlling on your behalf. We are controlling very uh, volatile regions in the world, like the Middle East. But now, it's more. So all this pan turkish talk uh, is mostly talk, especially you know when Armenians start speaking about it. Frankly. You know, Erdogan is a political beast. You know, he is not ideological in any way. You know, I don't think you know he is really such a strong believer even in Islam. But here he saw an opportunity uh, to export his influence to another volatile region, Central Asia, where the uh, post-Soviet states are very unsure of themselves. They were dumped in you know, places like even Kazakhstan. Turkmenistan, you know, where they speak languages understandable, at least, you know, to the Turks, somewhat understandable, you know, so you can make a plausible claim that they're kindred uh, ethnic, uh, co-ethnics. Co However, you know, they have a big problem, you know, in 1991, with the collapse of Soviet Union, Central Asia was essentially dumped. They were not, let me remind you, you know, again, very important detail. Uh, even president of Kazakhstan, let alone you know, lesser uh, Central Asian republics, Nur Sultan Nazarbayev himself was not even invited to the negotiations between uh, Yeltsin, president of Russia, uh, Kravchuk, president of Ukraine, and at that time there was such a, for a forgettable name as Shushkevich of Belarus, on the dissolution of Soviet Union. They were not even consulted, they were informed that as of now there is no more Soviet Union, goodbye. And you are independent, you are booted out of the Soviet Union and you have neighbors like, like Afghanistan. What can you do? Create your own military. You can invite the Russians to stay, they tried, you know, but would Russians be strong enough? And Russian military performance, say, in Chechnya in the 1990s was not really stellar. And therefore, you know, the, the question emerges, you know, if Americans are out of Afghanistan, if China keeps on pressing with their very silky road, then what? How could a place like even Kazakhstan you know, balance its, uh, its geopolitics and its geoeconomic interests? And here comes Turkey into it. But then, you know, one more very sizable question, let me remind you, you know, that Russia itself has a population of uh, Turkic speakers who are quite nationalist by now after 30 years of, uh, after the collapse of Soviet Union, when nationalism uh, was very strongly suppressed and there was a different ideology actually in the Soviet times, you know, helping to suppress local nationalism. 
There is Tatarstan, very assertive. There is Bashkortostan. Uh, they speak languages, again, understandable to the Turks, and they are just uh, autonomous within Russian Federation. By the way, this is to all these very naive arguments about Armenia sharing civilizational Christian heritage with Russia. Give me a break, you know, more than 20% of Russia's population now are historically Muslim. When I say historically, it's very much like Azerbaijan, you know. I'm not saying that they're practicing, but it's very cultural. cultural, you know, but it's very difficult for them to associate with these historical signs of Russian patriotism because Tatarstan, Tatars were conquered by Ivan the Terrible, which actually is taught in every textbook in Tatarstan. And now, and that's very much in the middle of Russia. Again, always look at the map. Geopolitics is all about the maps. Tatarstan is right there in the middle of Russia. It's in, along the Volga region. You know, if Tatarstan becomes disloyal to Russia, this is much more serious than Chechnya or Dagestan. So this must be concerning Moscow a great deal. So what can they do? And we see probably just the beginning of a long game. This game, the Russian game, you know, will, and Russians are very good at playing long games, and Putin in particular, he mastered that. So he's not kind of a quick spectacular. Sometimes, you know, he can move quickly and spectacular, like in the Crimea. But most of the time, if they can do slow strangulation, this is a more sure way. And that requires economic power, and Russians are not quite sure of their own economic power. So what we see is another very important alarm going on in Moscow that Russia needs economic reform. Something very serious, something they can control, but they're very afraid of it. You know, last time in the 1980s, they tried economic reform. It ended in disaster. So what, what can they do now? So we're going to see lots of changes in the coming years. Uh, all of this makes me step back to something I was reading uh, recently. It was in Deng Xiaoping's uh, biography. And this was a discussion, I think, around 1980 when the reform process was just starting. Deng Xiaoping's the person who made essentially China what it is today and probably one of the 10, 15 most important figures in the 20th century for people who don't know. Uh, and there was a lot of discussion around him about China should do this, not that you know, we, we're going to become a great power and we should do that. And him being the wise old hand that he was, uh, just listened to all of them and said, hey, you know what, uh, you're all wrong. China should put its head down for the next 20 years and work. Uh, my question for you is, uh, should Armenia put its head down for the next 20 years and work on focus on economy, governance, and military? And there is a synergy between all three. Uh, should that be our mantra for the next 20 years? Well, first part, sadly, of your statement, you know, holding your head down has already happened. It's already happened, you know, so Armenians must hold their head down. You know, the small country which lost the war, and let's face it, you know, there is no prospect of winning it back. You know, so there are people you who know, very naively ask me, you know, will we get back to Kelbajar? No. I, it's very improbable. Also because Russia will not allow it, you know, simply because they need to continue their influence in, in Azerbaijan. You know, they have their the interests. You know. So you must understand all those games around you, much bigger players' games. You know, and we haven't even started about the United States and Europe here, uh, in order to see whether you can have your own small game. And your own small game exactly should be you know, focusing on governance, focusing on um, economy, making Armenia uh, attractive for Armenians. So all this question in diaspora. You know, so uh, how can we continue? You know, the only way to continue with diaspora in the world of globalization, and now that diaspora is mostly in uh, non-Eastern countries. In the East, in say, somewhere in the Lebanon or in Iraq, in Iran, it was actually easy to preserve your identity because you were in a ghetto. But in California or in France or in Russia, for that matter, it's not going to be easy because you're open you know, to the society around you, because your children are going to speak you know, the majoritarian language, because they're making their careers. 
So the only way uh, for ethnic survival, and if we value that as ethnic survival, is to keep Armenia as a touchstone. So there has to be this, sometimes people disparagingly call it you know, Indian reservation on the last remaining Armenian lands mm -hmm. uh, here, but it must be run properly. Not only properly, but again, to quote you, you know, Armenia cannot afford to be a mediocre country. You can be mediocre when you are in Central Europe, you are surrounded by EU nations. Here, you cannot. So you have to be very clear. We need a lot of pol good political thinking, actually education for the larger society. Because, let me remind you, Armenia is a democracy. It's a very stormy, but it's a democracy. So here, public opinion matters. So we have to work with public opinion in, in Armenia itself, in diaspora, and that I always include the Russian diaspora, Armenian, but do not forget, there are lots of Armenians in Ukraine, in Kazakhstan still. Uh, making sure they understand you know, that there is a struggle, that this struggle is in only one respect, we're, in, uh, we're like China, or not only China, you know, we're like Singapore, South Korea, Taiwan, because we lost a war and there is no way of resuming a war. China in 1979, when they started their reform, why did they start the reform? Because they had a war with Vietnam, as always, remind you. you know, China had, and it was a disaster, you know, they could not overpower Vietnam. Uh, look at Taiwan, it's still there. You know, South Korea, you know, despite more than a million Chinese troops in Korea in the early 1950s, they could not uh, overpower it against the American uh, or international alliance, which included a few Turkish divisions at the time. Uh, then what do you do? You know, so you can do only self-strengthening. You know, so you must strengthen your economy. And this is a separate, very big question. How can you strengthen the economy? But there, there can be no strong economy without good governance. And again, look at Singapore. Look even at Taiwan. It could strong governments governance doesn't need uh, to be authoritarian or democratic. It should be competent. It should be competent. Uh, going back to the Russian play here, and I think one of the one of the things that I've thought about is, you know, there's that old phrase as you need to be more Catholic. You know, if someone's trying to be more Catholic than the Pope. Mm -hmm. uh, in this case, since we are married to this hegemon. Uh, you obviously lose a certain level of independence, but uh, the, the issue becomes to what extent are your issue, wh how, what can you do to enhance your value to them and to use where your interests coincide mm -hmm. in your advantage and to mitigate where there's contradictions in your interests. Where, where is it with the Russians that our interests coincide, and where is it that there's contradictions that there could be problems? Uh, I think, this is preliminary analysis, I think that the interests coincide very significantly, and these are, in this case, you know, these are not only the interests of Putin, you know, because the specific interests of Vladimir Putin are in domestic political survival, and of uh, his groups, you know, so we can have no say about it. But Armenia has uh, clearly geopolitical interest in, sync, in synchrony, you know, with Russian uh, interest in the Middle East and in the South Caucasus. But Armenia also ha has its own uh, game to play. I'm going to say something probably un scandalous at this moment, you know, but Armenia is almost like part of Russian Federation at this point. However, it is not under any international sanctions. So Armenia is sort of like an uh, extraterritorial uh, unit within the Russian constellation, like it or not, you know, if somebody in the West asks, you know, why are you so pro-Russian, uh, ask them, why do you keep Turkey in the NATO alliance? You know, why you never so one is, their, one is their reaction yeah. to the other. So I think you know, this is a very easy uh, argument to, uh, to be made. You know, that our interest is now in being uh, a globally oriented part of the Russian, greater Russian economy. 
So that's it, you know, so that Armenians have diaspora again, you know, so this is a very important role for diaspora as uh, lobbyists, as businessmen. You can now abandon, you know, the symbolic issues, you know, like recognition of genocide, Russia recognized genocide. You know, everybody knows, you know, so this is, this is passé. So the most important thing now is to make Armenia work, to make it uh, economically successful. For this, we need your connections, we need your capital, and we are very much like Hong Kong or Singapore, a staging ground to a much bigger country. In this case, actually probably two bigger countries, because don't forget about Iran. Yeah, you know, so there is Russia, there is Iran, and we need to see, you know, so where Armenia uh, can create, you know, higher value added products and become just attractive for living here. You know, so we need to boost the population. Yeah, I'll say something about Iran, which is, I think, a lot of people miss. Is I think at some point this year, when the Iranian presidential elections happen, you're going to probably have an IRGC candidate that's going to become president. And I think their posture towards Azerbaijan is likely to get more aggressive. Uh, and not be as friendly as the clerical regime was, uh, because I think they would they would be far less kind about the Israeli connections with Azerbaijan than the old regime was, and far less forgiving, and more aggressive. So we could we, we could be looking at that as a variable for next year. Uh, I'm going to close with something that is not Armenia related, but it's very topical to today's uh, uh, to, to our times. Uh, you lived through the Soviet collapse which was quite unexpected. If, I'm assuming if someone in 1986 would have predicted that the Soviet Union doesn't exist in 1991, people would have been laughing at you, mm -hmm. pretty much anywhere in the world, actually. Uh, even though there's no direct historical analogies, and these are diff different times in different countries, what I get a lot of is what people have seen in the United States in the, in the year 2020, which was the disastrous COVID response and now the attempted coup which was unimaginable in that country even a few years ago. Uh, and I, unfortunately, I don't think those issues are going away. And generally, the two things that both of these countries have in common is that they're global powers and they're empires. And when empires start disintegrating politically, it's very hard to control and it's never pretty. To what extent are these comparisons that are being made now valid? To what extent are they fanciful? And how are they relevant to us? In world politics and in history, there are no complete analogies. There could not be. Each country is different. However, I wouldn't say that each country is unique either. For instance, uh, comparisons between Russian Empire and Ottoman Empire could be very informative. And they have been actually learning from each other because learning from the enemy is one of the best ways of learning, you know, just like Russians have been learning from Germans, you know, for a very long time. Now, uh, let me use this uh, analogy, then, that the United States and the Soviet Union were different, just like different cars. You know, there is a Cadillac and there is a Soviet military truck, much less comfortable, probably prone to break down, you know, once in a while. Uh, however, both are vehicles, they both have engines, they have brakes, they have wheels. You know, so when you start looking you know, for general architecture, you, know, you see uh, similarities. Uh, in fact, this was a very common view in the 1960s, 1970s, through the collapse of the Soviet Union, it was called convergence. You know, that they started from different points, you know, that America was very libertarian, was once in these heroic times in the 19th, 30th century. Uh, it was very pro-market, American dream, and Soviet Union started with a very harsh authoritarian collectivist, collectivist regime. However, they were moving, you know, as Americans, after Second World War, were adopting you know, more and more big government, social democratic, social democratic policies, you know, because they had to. Uh, or they called them Keynesian or whatever, you know, and the Soviet Union was experimenting more with democratization and markets. They were going to converge somewhere in the golden mean. You know, this did not happen. However, they did converge in crisis. Let me remind you, you know, the sequence. Both superpowers 
attributed to themselves victory over fashion. Both superpowers in the 1950s uh, achieved spectacular rates of uh, economic growth and great scientific achievements, you know, space. Both superpowers, of course, like all politicians, attributed to themselves all the good things, you know, that look, you know, the 1930s, Americans didn't want to think about Great Depression again. Uh, the Soviets didn't want to think about Stalinism and all the harsh repression of the 1930s. That's behind us. Now we have science. And by the way, what was the prestige of science? You know, so all these guys uh, with brains, the eggheads, you know, they now tell us, you know, how to run uh, the economy scientifically. And there was just competition, you know, who is going to export whose model, you know, to the rest of the world. So the United States, you know, with American way of life or the Soviet scientific communism. And one of the grounds where the superpowers clashed was Vietnam, to re remind you. And in the beginning, it looked almost too simple. It was, of course, it was, you sent U.S. Air Force. How could they not win a war in a poor third world country? Uh, tipping one of the peripheral wars. That ended in disaster, but disaster was not only military. You know, it was not military disaster for the United States as such. It was very humiliating and it was very costly because you have to spend a lot of uh, political capital and actual money in making sure that your allies still support you. So that's called usually aid. And making sure you know, that the uh, Critics domestically are mitigated. You know, that's why, say, President Lyndon Johnson was all about, you know, great society and more reforms. And such surprising things, you know, that one U.S. president which ever came close to universal health care was Richard Nixon, because he was under the threat of the Watergate scandal. Uh, very similarly, uh, in the 1980s, you know, the Soviet leader Gorbachev went in that direction. He almost introduced capitalist and market economy and democratization. The Soviet Union tried to make a jump and collapsed during this jump. Why? Because there were ethnic republics, because there was Ukraine and Tatarstan and Armenians actually you know, don't appreciate their own complicity in the collapse of Soviet Union because by raising the issue of Nagorno-Karabakh, they created an impossible uh, headache for Moscow. In the United States, there are no ethnic republics, but there is a race issue. It's a very important issue for the United States. You know, so there were two kinds of pressures on superpower gover uh, governments. First, grant special status to ethnic minorities. So in the United States, you know, all kinds of minorities. In the Soviet Union, you know, grant special status, more and more special statuses to ethnic republics. And by the way, autonomous republics within Russia, Tatarstan, Chechnya, remember those places. Uh, Karabakh is an autonomous province within Azerbaijan at the time. Right? Uh, and second, intellectuals or intelligentsia. You know. Hey, you know, we are so well educated and we, how come we do not participate in governance? So we want to bring uh, reality um, to bear on political institutions. You know. We want more access through free press both in the United States and here, you know, more access to independent press. And eventually, of course, you know, once we gain uh, this power, we want to participate in parliamentary procedures. Uh, Russia is still facing this problem, you know. So to conclude this very sketchy, so if you want, you know, you can read, you have a, several articles on that, what was the Soviet Union, comparisons with the United States were, were drawn, there is an article on that, however, to conclude, in geopolitics, big catastrophes never come in one blow. Even look at Germany, World War I, and then rising from the knees, and World War II. Look at France in the 18th century, you know, so it was French-Indians War, or in Europe it was called the Seven Years' War, then French Revolution, Napoleon Bonaparte, and Waterloo. America had its Vietnam Syndrome, and is going to hit a second crisis. It's already hitting it. Russia, had, or Soviet Union went through the disintegration. Do they face it now again? So these are big worries and we must hope, you know, that both remnants of superpower, they find a way out of it, something like more peaceful way, something like China and the economic growth 
Or let me remind you, what is the European Union? It's essentially a club of defeated empires. Right? You know, they're all, you know, Sweden, Germany, Spain, Portugal, Britain, United Kingdom, you know, could never make up their mind, you know, do they want to be in continental Europe with the rest, with the former Austro-Hungarian Empire, or they still have their own empire overseas. However, the place of Russia is squarely in Europe on uh, this parameter. And I very much hope, you know, that the problems between Russia and Europe get sorted out eventually, and that Armenia is part of that. You know, we should be helping, you know, both Europeans and Russians to uh, re-establish their relations. Because, to conclude, you know, there is a country which is somewhat similar to Armenia. We rarely think about it. It's Greece. Greece was also an Ottoman dependency. It was a province of Ottoman Empire. It had, of course, much bigger ambitions, but Constantinople remained Istanbul and Smyrna is Izmir. So there is much smaller Greece, but there is Greece. And frankly, historically speaking, its place is between Syria and Egypt. However, it is in Europe. For all the problems that Greece faces, they're in Europe. So that is actually doable. Well, well, uh, well you know, people, a lot of people don't notice the per capita income in Greece is twice that of Turkey's with all of their problems. Well, uh, Professor Darugan, it was a pleasure having you. It was quite informative as always. Thank you for being our guest. This is your host of CivilNet, Eric Kopian, and thank you for joining us.